Let's try that again. Good morning. I am so glad to be back. Welcome to worship. I see some new faces and that is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to have some of you back. For those of you who may be joining us online, I'm Reverend Linda Snyder. You can call me Pastor Linda and um, it is my privilege to lead us in worship this morning. Um, it was good to be gone and I thank you for your prayers. The Lord protected us at this wedding from getting any anything that might be going around. We had a great time camping, but, um, but I am really glad to be back. Last week, I know that Rich preached the great commandment to love God and to love others. And we do that best when we proclaim the love of Jesus with words and actions. So what we do matters, which means that shoeboxes matter. And I see that we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine here. I know the last time I looked, there were six on the website that had been done. So I thought that you might take and want to know why these shoeboxes matter so much. They actually take the gospel to the unreached. The way we express the love of Jesus Christ and the passion that he had is that we go out there and we serve others. We go to the out-of-bound places, the ends of the earth. The world is changing, but the gospel doesn't change. The message of the cross doesn't change. We're going to make every effort to share the gospel. The world has been decimated by COVID-19, but the work here at Samaritan's Purse, it never stops. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. And we do it through Operation Christmas Shop. It's a platform that God has God given Samaritan Curse to share the gospel more than 10 million times every year. Jesus loves you. The wonderment of it is that the child's encounter is not with material things. By faith, the encounter is with things unseen, and they're receiving that for the very first time. From the shoebox to the greatest journey, this is the Great Commission. During this pandemic, during all the fear that COVID-19 has brought to the world, this is when we go out and share the truth. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a job to do. This is what these shoe boxes are all about, going out in the heart of this darkness, the heart of this fires, to go out and to bring a hope of Jesus Christ around the world. Is there a sense of urgency? Yes, there is. Because there's kids out there without the knowledge and the hope of Jesus Christ. Get out there to be a part of this. Right now, it's the time. Seed Company, uh, Operation Christmas Child, have been brought together by God's grace. And we're so happy that the partnership is working together to reach the unreached people groups. These boxes have an incredible way of blessing, opening up hearts to hear and respond to the truth, but also to give us access into areas that are restricted. The wonderment of it is that the prayer has gone forward with that shoe box. And by faith, the child's encounter is not with material things. By faith, the encounter is with things unseen. And they're receiving that for the very first time. In this century, and probably within the next decade, every single unreached people group will have the opportunity to receive the gospel. Jesus is the light of the world. He who follows him will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. God's message, God's word, that living word is never dormant. Jesus Christ is the son of God, it's true. Jesus Christ took our sins and he died on the cross. And then on the third day, God in heaven said it's enough and he raised his son to life. This is the good news, and we've got a responsibility to take this message to the ends of the earth.
Even when you do it online, you can send a picture of yourself. You can send a note like they suggest you do in the boxes that you do um, physically. So I will encourage you to do that. Dedication will be in two weeks on, on November the 15th. It's not too late to join Bible study, so if you think that we've gotten too far along, we haven't, we're only in Acts chapter 5. We had a really great um, energizing discussion today, so, um, so I encourage you to get with me if you want to do that via Zoom. It starts at 9.15. Today is the final day that you can sign up for that presbytery meeting. You've seen the, the picture and the announcements about the castle and spiritual warfare over on the table I have six applications if you are interested um, we are going to be the topic will be spiritual warfare breaking spiritual strongholds in the local church and the speaker is the the Presbyterian Reform Ministries International Global Prayer Mobilizer Martin Boardman is someone I went all the way to Black Mountain to sit under and to have some advanced training. This was part of our Dunamis 5 training that John and Don and I all had. But Satan, as we know, is alive and well in the world, and his favorite place to attack is the church. And so this is a picture of what that might look like and how we can avoid it. So there are registration forms. If you want to go, you need to fill it out today. Give it to me, and I will see that you get in the link for the Zoom for next Saturday at 9 o'clock. Um, next Sunday we will have communion it's been scheduled by session so if you're listening to us online we are glad you're with us and we encourage you to get your your bread and your cup and your things ready to be able to do communion um, next week but for right now um, I want you to know that following the sermon we're going to have a time of personal prayer for our country I have not forgotten that this is a pivotal week but right now, John and the praise team are going to help us enter into worship. And when we do this, I want you to keep your eyes on what we're doing. We're giving praise to the one who shines in the darkness, whose glory fills the whole earth. I'm stealing lines from your music. We it's, are also going in, it's also in the Bible. I know it is. <laughs> we are going to praise the name of the Lord our God, because injustice bows to Jesus because at the cross we are forgiven. In the resurrection, sin and death were defeated, and one day the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, is going to return in a white robe to bring us home. So as we stand to give God praise and glory, let's focus on what we're singing, and let's enter into the very throne room of God Almighty. Please stand.
Father God, we just open ourselves to you right now just to lift our praises to you, Lord, and just to, just to experience you. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for, this presence, for your presence in this place, for your presence in our heart, Lord. We just ask that you open our hearts. Lord God, as we gather together this morning to, to worship with other churches, raising our praises to you. Just, um, we just ask that all churches just come together, Lord. We know we just have a want to come together and, and for your glory, for this nation. In Jesus' name.
Wow, let's give God a great big Amen. hand. Praise. Amen. Woo! You may be seated and the children can leave with Melissa for mid-kids worship. And let's just remind you, I'm back where I was three weeks ago. We're looking at um, what it means to be a na one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll tell you right up front, this is not a political sermon today, so don't tune out. But let me share with you our opening um, video for the sermon series. I, I pledge allegiance to the Of the United States of America. Of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands. One nation. Would you pray with me? Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit come upon me, that my words are your words for your people and for myself. I ask that you make clear what may seem muddy. I ask that you keep our eyes fixed on you. In Jesus' name, through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Now that video you saw ended with a question mark. Under God? But biblically, there is no question mark. Here's why. If you'll put up my first slide, God is sovereign. God rules over everything. We know that because Psalm 103, 19 proclaims that the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. And in his sovereignty, God has chosen to make Jesus supreme above all. So for the people who are not followers of Jesus Christ, they believe in the creator God, but that's not enough because God has chosen to put Jesus supreme over all. I believe I have another scripture that's there. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him. All things hold together. God is sovereign. Say that with me. And therefore, every nation is under God. More specifically, every nation is under Jesus. Here's what Psalm 44, 8 says. It says, God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. I don't have a slide for every scripture this morning. That's why Paul tells the church in Rome that they are to submit to the governing authorities because whether we believe it or not, whether we like it or not, government is a divine institution. You can put that one up. Government is a divine institution. This is what Paul tells the Romans in the very first verse of chapter 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. Now, before you get eggs to, sh to hit me, before you scream, before you stress out, before you tune out, I want to clarify what I mean by every nation being under God. Many nations in the past, including Israel, God's chosen people in that nation, in the present and nations that might develop in the future, many nations function under the illusion that government has nothing to do with God. That's an illusion. They hold no belief that Jesus Christ rules supreme over all. And every nation that claims to be under God, everyone, including the United States, 
that has ever or will be claiming to be under God, and they, they acknowledge God, is going to be completely obedient to God. So being under God's sovereignty and being obedient to his sovereignty are two very different things. Whether we believe in him or not, whether we are obedient to him or not, whether we like it or not, everyone and everything and every nation is under God. That scripture about Jesus said everything holds together in him. It was created through him, for him, and it holds together in him. No authority exists apart from God or that was not established or allowed by God. And that should make our stress level go way down right away because God's still in control no matter what happens in the future. The institution of governmental authority has been created, decreed, and established by God underneath his sovereign control. Because there's no government and no authority apart from God, you can't discuss government without bringing God into the discussion. Well, you can, but you shouldn't. Okay? God should be a part of every single discussion when we're thinking about the government. Now, I told you at the very beginning, today is not about politics. And it's not even about the election. Today is about God's sovereignty. And how in his sovereignty, God created you and me in his image. For the purpose of us co-reigning, governing, ruling over the earth with him. It goes all the way back to the very first book in the Bible, to the book of Genesis, when it says God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule, reign. That's what that word subdue means. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So today is about giving you a biblical perspective of what it means to be under God, whether we believe him or not, whether we are obedient or not, whether we like it or not, everything, everyone, and every nation is under God. Now, in the Bible, there are four systems of government, and I'm going to race through the first three so we can get to the last one. The first system of government is self-government. We were created in the image of God to be co-rulers, to be to reign. We're called to live our lives according to the principles found in God's word. In the book of Ecclesiastes, an Old Testament book of poetry, it says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. So ultimately, we were created to worship God so we could enjoy him forever. We were created to be self-governed. Okay? The second form of government is family or marriage. So when two people get together to create a group, then that constitutes another form of governing authority that God has given us in Scripture. God established the family as the foundation of civilization. Children are to obey their parents. No ifs, ands, or bad about it. It isn't up to us. It's what God says. Husbands and wives are to submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. And if you don't believe me, you can go to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5 and chapter 6, and read all about it. So in the family unit, there is established lines of authority. And then we have a third system of governing, and that is the church. Now, that didn't really start the way we see it today until after Pentecost. But the church leaders are to govern matters that apply to the church and or church members. In our church, we have a session. And you elect them, and they are told to govern to make sure that we are on God's mission doing God's things. They don't lead all the programs. They govern. They make sure that we're on task. And their, rule is, their role is crucial. The church's role is crucial because the progress of a nation is directly related to the state of its morality. 
the progress of a nation is directly related to the state of its morality. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. Even John Adams, one of our founding fathers, said this, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. If you want to have a democracy, then it's got to be the democracy of moral people who believe in God, who see themselves as under God. As Christ followers, we're not called to run away from culture. We're not called to fight culture. We're called to influence culture, to be light when culture gets dark. And the fourth form of governing authority is civil government. Those are national covenants. And it tells us, if you'll put this one up, the biblical role of civil government is to maintain a safe, just, righteous, and compassionately responsible environment for freedom to flourish. Not freedom to do whatever, but freedom for each person in that nation to be who God created him or her to be when he created us in his image. All civil government is under God. And civil government that is obedient to God restricts the flow of evil. It stops the flow of evil while simultaneously and intentionally seeks to expand the flow of good. But it does not interfere with or negate or contradict God's other governing agencies. Remember, we have our self-governing, we have our family government, we have our church government. Civil government is supposed to support, not replace, what God calls the family to do, what God calls the church to do what God calls us as individuals to do. So that self-government, the freedom to be, these new creations in Christ, to love one another as Jesus loved us, can be experienced. That's really what Paul is talking about in the whole first five verses of Romans 13, when he does a big expose of the government. And you have to remember when he's writing this, he is talking to people who are under Roman rule, which is not godly, has chosen not to be obedient to God, but Paul says is still under God because God ordained government as one of the authorities. So let's take a look at the scripture from Romans 13, 1 to 5. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course, you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. I want to go back. They are, the authorities are God's servants sent for your good. When, when we believe that we are a nation under God, that's what our authorities do. So you must submit to them not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. What does it mean to be a nation under God? I already told you it's not a question mark. It's an it's a exclamation point because we're under God whether we're obedient or not. We're under God whether we think we're under God or not. Well, Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. The story of a nation is the story of its citizens expanded, written large. What the citizens do, especially in a democracy, becomes the story of a nation. One nation under God begins with you and me being under God. Psalm 1 begins this way. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take 
or sit in the company of mockers. If you and I are under God, then God is more than a spare tire or a slot machine or a genie in a bottle. Let me show you what I mean by that. I have a great video because I think we need to know what it means for us to walk under God. Far too many people, even Christians, have turned God into a spare tire. We want him in the vicinity in case life goes flat. So we go to the trunk then and we take out the spare while the flat tire is being repaired. But as soon as the flat tire is repaired, God is now removed and placed back into the trunk until things go flat again. As long as things are not flat, we want him close, but in the trunk. Or others want to turn God into a slot machine. They want to pull the lever so they can hear the clinging of the blessing. Who do not want to recognize that he created us for a relationship and he wants to oversee us in a rule of ownership and therefore placing ourselves under his authority. How do you know if you fear God? How do you know you're not just talking a good game? How do you know that this thing is real and not just religious conversation and Christianese. He says, because at the end of verse one, you walk in his ways. You fear God with your feet, not with your feelings. You fear God with your movement, not just with your mouth. You fear God with your life, not merely your lips, with your walk, not merely your talk. If you wanna know if you fear God, see which way your feet are moving. If you were in Bible study with us this morning, we talked quite a bit about fear and a holy awe of God, and, and that's really what that is saying. To be under God is to live in holy awe of him. That's really what fear of God means. The further God, the person of God, and the law of God is removed from the life of an individual, is removed from our lives. The further God and the law of God is removed from how we look at family and marriage. The further God and the law of God and the call of God to reach the lost is removed from a church. And the further God and the, and the call of God and the rules of God are removed from the life and definition of a nation, the more chaotic those entities become. Now, I have been watching football recently. I, am, I will admit that I am not a football player. Play, I've never been a football player, but I am not a football like follower, big time, huge time. Okay, um, but I know that when I watch football, that there are two teams that battle head to head to win a victory. Right? I mean, I know that much. They war against each other in order to declare to the world which one of them is the greatest on any given day. Right? But what most people don't recognize is that in every football game. There aren't just two teams on the field. There are three teams who participate. There's the home team, there's the visiting team, and then there's that team that wear the red and, or the black and white, you know, striped things that aren't really in jail. They're the referees, right? I think they, they still wear black and white, right? Okay, yes. Ryan is laughing, so I had to be sure that I was describing this correctly. Two of those teams in the battle have the same desire. They want to win. They want to prove that they're the best. But in order to win, they go after different goals. Literally in football, they go after different goals. And those teams use various strategies and various plays to try to accomplish their goal. But that third team, that official black and white jerseys team, governs each and every war. The third team doesn't take sides, or at least they're not supposed to take sides with either of the teams in the battle. If they did, they would be disqualified from what they have been put there to do. This third team is not committed to either of the teams that are beating each other up. Rather, they owe their allegiance to a higher entity. They owe their allegiance to the league office of the NFL. That's the team they're on. That's under the little G God that they operate. It is the job of the third team 
to set forth the rules and give them guidance and regulations by which the battle is played out. It's the job of the third team to operate in the midst of these two competing parties to carry out the intentions and governance of the NFL. And whatever this team says overrides and overrules both teams. This team, this team of referees, only holds allegiance as far as if they are willing to be in alignment with the NFL policy that sits in front of them. What I'm suggesting to you as we look at one nation under God this morning is that one of the greatest tragedies of the church of Jesus Christ today is that we have lost our ability and our authority to be an influence on those around us because we've forgotten whose team we're on. We've forgotten who we are under. We've lost this because we've divided and we've aligned ourselves with politics and parties. We've switched the rule book. Let me tell you what I mean. When one of you comes to me and you do and say, Pastor Linda, I need to, to help, have you help me with my marriage or with this relationship or with a child, I don't come back with, I hope I don't come back with you and say, well, my opinion is blah, 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 blah. What I hope that I do, what I believe that I do, is I open up God's word and I communicate what God says about that issue you are having. If you come to me for help with finances, well, you don't come to me, you go to Don. But, but if you go to Don with help for finances, he will teach you financial peace. Because it's biblical, because he wants you to know what God has to say about your money, not what he thinks about your money. That doesn't matter. And we, instead of taking God's side, instead of speaking light, instead of holding our government accountable to what God says the government should do, and that's another whole sermon, that's another whole study, we have failed to, to be the referees. We failed to speak the truth. Believers have allowed political experience and political particulars to override the kingdom of God. I want you to know as we enter into this election, God has not given his allegiance to any party. His allegiance belongs to God himself. We talked about that a little bit in Bible study too. God is God. And we are to have a healthy fear, a holy awe of him, and not be questioning whether, whether we think this is right that God did or that is right that God did or God should. God is God. And as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we represent his kingdom. We represent his word. If you're a citizen of Christ, I told you a couple weeks ago, you're an ambassador of heaven in whatever political capacity you choose to position yourself. So as we live under God, knowing that at this point, my guess is the fate of the elections have been decided. There have been enough early votes and enough people who will continue. You know, I can't control what happens on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday when by the time they figure out who has won. All I can control is my response and what I look to government to do is that biblical or not. That's what I can control. And so as I, we live under God, I think as believers right now, there are three things we need to do. One is we need to humble ourselves, and we need to be in prayer. We need to humble ourselves, and we need to be in prayer. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now, God is talking about the nation of Israel when he says that. But because every nation is under God, God will heal a nation that chooses to be obedient to him. On the eve of this very difficult season, we're called to be humbled, not arrogant. And we're called to pray. We are called to pray for our leaders, no matter who they are. We are called to be a pray for them because we are called to hold them accountable to the peacefulness and environment in which we live. 
Paul wrote a letter to Timothy, a young pastor who I'm sure was in over his head in, in the church that he was pastoring, that one of those early churches. And this is what Paul says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority. Remember I told you, you can't take God out of government because God invented government that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. What do I want you to know today? Well, I want you to know that there is no part of God's word that doesn't impact the world we live in and the things we struggle with and the challenges we face and the fears we have. God's word's got it all covered. And I want you to be encouraged. Because if you take away nothing, this is what I want you to take away. No matter what party holds office, our God still holds the world. He still holds our nation. We are still under him, obedient or disobedient. At some point, when we are past all of this frenzy, I would love to do a Bible study, I think, on what government is supposed to do. I have found that quite eye-opening in the past couple of days. But for today, what I want us to do is spend some time in prayer. I'm going to open with a video from Psalms to remind us that we can be still. And being still and knowing that God is God, having this holy awe before him, allows us to bring everything we are afraid of and everything we face to him. When the video has ended, I'm not going to say a word, but I'm going to ask that you close your eyes and bow your heads, whether you're with us here or you're with us online, and you pray. You pray whatever it is that God brings to your heart. You pray for the president. You pray for the new president. If it's a different president or the same president, you pray for the Senate. You pray for the Congress. You pray for your, our own leaders. You pray for the people who have been dealing with hurricanes. You pray for COVID. You pray for peace. You pray for whatever it is that God puts on your heart. And then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. But I beg you as God's people to be ambassadors, to take seriously our call to be involved in government, but to know that the team we serve is God's team. And that God is not a Democrat or a Republican. God's on his own team because God is separated differently on a whole different level from us. God is God and we are not. So be still and know that God is God.
time of prayer and silence. So let's go before God. Father, in the stillness of this moment, we come before you, we bow before you, we acknowledge your authority over our lives, over our families, over our church, over our nation, and over the world. We ask that we be beacons of light, that you energize us with the gospel of truth as we extend the hand of your grace. Father, forgive us for where we have been arrogant, for where we have been apathetic. Hold us together as your people. Father, this morning I pray for Bill Rigger, who is having an MRI today at 1115 for his back, and then on November 17th goes back to a cardiologist for a follow-up appointment for his heart. He has shared that he feels like his body's just falling apart, and so, Father, you heal him from the inside out and heal his fear and give him peace. Father, I know that there are many other requests. I don't have them, but we've already said them, and so we come to you now praying the prayer that Jesus gave us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I will remind you that there are offering baskets at the door, and I will thank everyone who continues to give so faithfully online. I've been struggling for the past day because I hadn't brought it up to session or anybody else to ask for permission, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. 
If you are interested in gathering together tomorrow night before our nation goes to the polls, I will do a Zoom meeting. I will send an email out to everyone with a link, and we'll do a Zoom meeting at 7 o'clock for prayer. So um, anybody that wants to can do so. Anybody that can fit that in their schedule can do so. If not, I would ask that all of you stop and pray together as a family of God at 7 tomorrow night. So I'll send that in an email. Be sure you look for it this afternoon or tomorrow morning so that you have a chance to join in. And if you're with us online and can't, um, can't get to that, all you have to do is send me a note through the website and I will send you a link. Let's stand as we gather to sing our final hymn, Another Way That We Praise and Give Glory to God. Please stand. And this one, sing out. your joy and peace and comfort that you find in him. And may his word be an encouragement this week in particular that no matter what happens, God is still on the throne. And we, we are his people. I invite you to join us next week when I'm going to preach about being indivisible. How do we do that? 
as the people of God.